Major funding for this program is provided by grants from HSH Nordbank, New York Branch, and First American Title Insurance Company of New York. Additional funding is provided by grants from Signature Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, the Wickhoff Group, and the Engel Berman Group. Welcome to Building New York. My name is Michael Stoller. Sixty-seven years ago, in Brooklyn, a guy was born, a very nice, interesting guy who goes to NYU Commerce, School of Commerce, goes to NYU Law, becomes an attorney, becomes a developer, and probably has been responsible for more developments and changes in the real estate scene all over New York. I'm very fortunate today to have as my guest Leonard Boxer, senior partner, chairman of the real estate department at Strook and Strook and Levon, and also a developer on his own. Thank you for being here. My pleasure. So, you, you were born in Flappish? Where were you born? I was born in East Flappish later moved to Flatbush and went to Erasmus Hall High School. A lot of people you know, of notoriety went to Erasmus Hall. I think Absolutely. Barbara Streisand and a number of real estate developers. So now, when, when you were in high school, after you went to high school, how, how did you decide to go to NYU? You know, we're on the CUNY network, but you can, how, how, how did you decide to go to the School of Commerce at NYU? Well, it's very interesting. Uh, I lost my father when I was a year old, and I was brought up by my grandparents, basically, while my mother went to work. And one of the conditions that my grandfather had placed upon me was I can go to any school as long as I came home in the evening. And I had a desire to perhaps go to the Wharton School, but as it worked out, I was accepted at NYU in the School of Commerce, and I was able to come home in the evening and had a, had a job in the evening, and it, it worked out very well. Now, you graduated as an accountant, mm -hmm. and then you went to law school. Oh, yeah, and that, that's something interesting. When I graduated from the School of Commerce as an, accounti as an accounting major, in those days, that was looked down upon because I had a BS degree and not a Bachelor of Arts. And it really took some doing to be able to get me into NYU Law School. But I was fortunate to get in there, and the rest is history, Michael. Now, you, 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 now, you were working for a supermarket chain, you told me. You worked oh, yeah. for the Big Apple supermarkets. When Was that during college or law school? Well, during, uh, during my college years, I worked at, my uncle was the accountant for the Big Apple uh, first fruit stores in New York and then supermarket chain, and I became the in-house accountant for the stores. And while I went to school during the day, I used to come about three o'clock and work as an accountant in the uh, Big Apple uh, main office. And then later on, you graduate law school and you go to work for a law firm in the surrogate business. Oh yeah, oh yeah. When I graduated law school, I, I, I got what was considered a coup in that I w received an offer to work for a surrogate practitioner in Brooklyn by the name of Dan Eisenberg, whose father-in-law was Maximilian Moss, who was the then surrogate of Kings County. And in those days, in the 60s, there were some very formidable estates in Brooklyn, and his practice was one of the premier trust and estates practices, in, in the, not only in Brooklyn, but in the city. So how does a guy who was an accountant who then is involved with a surrogate department get to get, gets into the real estate business? I mean, as you said, you, your father passed on when you were one, you know, you, 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 your, your stepdad and your mother worked and they weren't in the real estate. How, how do you decide to make the change from surrogate to the real estate law? 
Well, after being at this firm, which was called Eisenberg and Weiss, for about a year, I realized that the surrogate's practice was just not for me. And it was very fortunate. I, I served in, this, in the United States Army with somebody by the name of Brian Strum, who was a classmate of mine at law school. Brian and I were having lunch one day, and he was telling me that he was leaving his firm to become, I think at the time, assistant general counsel of the Prudential Insurance Company. But he had just turned down a terrific offer, and he thought perhaps I might be interested in that offer if I wanted to get into real estate law. I told Brian I really had no background in real estate law, but he said, I'm going to introduce you to this gentleman who's a lawyer who just took over a public company, and he thought it would be a terrific blend for the two of us. And with that, Brian introduced me to Bob Alnick, who was a lawyer, who was involved in real estate, and, ha and had just basically taken over with the Milstein family control of a public company called Starrett Housing Corporation. And he was going to become the CEO and president of the company. And he really had to leave his law firm to somebody to take care of it. He always had a great deal of pride in his law firm, and it wasn't something he was willing to give up. He had made a deal with one of his classmates by the name of Is Seltzer, who was his contemporary, and they made me a proposal to join the firm. That's how I ended up in real estate law. And, I mean, you know, Starrett, you know, when you're in New York, you hear about Starrett City, you have other things in Olmec. What, now, but you, you weren't in this business. So what, what, what type of work did you do at, uh, now this was, at that time it was called Olmec Milstein? No, it was, uh, at that time it was called, oh, it was called Olmec and Tannenbaum. He had just uh, become a partner of a fellow by the name of Bernard Tannenbaum, who was going to be my mentor at the firm. And I start work there, and within three months, Bernie Tannenbaum says, Lenny, I'm, I hate to tell you this, but I'm leaving. I've just been an off offered a partnership in one of the boutique real estate firms called Dreyer and Traub. I said, Bernie, what's going to happen to me? I remember that day very vividly. He said, well, Bob Olnick wants to talk to you. I went and I met Bob in a coffee shop. We had lunch, and Bob said, listen, I understand the position you're in now with no mentor to teach you the business. He said, it'll take perhaps three to six months, but we'll know if you have what it takes to become a real estate practitioner. And he and says, I promise you, I won't leave you alone. And that's when he brought in this classmate of his, Is Seltzer, who replaced Bernie Tannenbaum, and the rest is history. Now, how old were you when you uh, joined this? About 26 or 27? I mean, because you had just got married to Enid. Mm -hmm. um, Enid and I are married 41 years. So it was, and you were 26? Uh, I was about 26, 27 years old, and uh, it was very traumatic for me, and I, I had to be able to take on a new career and basically start fresh. But in hindsight, it was the best thing that happened to me in my career. Now, Bob Olnick and, and the Milsteins I mean, these are icons, the, the, the names, and they, they did things. And you were fortunate, because you were there and you were under the mentorship of, of a Bob Olnick, to be involved with some major transactions, Park Lane, Housing, Starrett City. Well, a lot of uh, subsidized. There, there was the time of tax shelters, you know, or well, you, know, you go Mitchell back to Lamas. tax shelters. One of the uh, great prides I have looking back at my career is basically a situation that we're faced with today in, the, in New York City. There was a lack of, of uh, middle-income housing in the city at the time, and Bob and I had worked together with other people to create what was the catalyst for what we see today as Michelama housing. Uh, what I had worked on was coming up with a tax scheme to enable investors in rental housing projects 
to put in the equity that was required to build the project, and in exchange for that, they got enormous tax benefits. The federal government had sanctioned this, and we had to get very difficult rulings, and we had to get a section of the private housing finance law, it was, I believe, section 16 passed. And I remember traveling to Albany with the then Governor Rockefeller to work out the logistics to get that passed. Once that, that section was passed, it became the catalyst for building thousands of, of apartments throughout New York, uh, most prominent of which I believe you'll see today on the West Side Urban right. Renewal. I mean, the, the majority of, of these houses on the West Side, Leader House, a lot of them on the between 70th, uh, between 80th and 96th Street were built because of the Mitchell Lama yeah, program. Absolutely, and, and they were built and, and by they some. provided housing for for the, what we need today, the workforce housing. Middle income, middle and lower middle income housing. And I guess the crowning achievement was when uh, United Housing decided, after they built Co-op City, that they decided they did not want to build a development on Pennsylvania Avenue in Brooklyn that was called Twin Pines. And Bob Olnick and I and Paul Milstein met with the Mr. Ostro, I think his name was, who was the head of United Housing, and we worked out a deal where Starrett and a company that Mr. Milstein, that Paul Milstein controlled, would basically take over that project and build what today is probably the largest subsidized housing project in the country and is a, a, a great benefit to not only the city, but an example how subsidized housing works in this country. How many units was there at City? I believe it's around 6,000 units in probably about 46 or 48 buildings. It was an enormous project that everybody thought was foolhardy to undertake, but it really became a city within a city, and I had a great deal of pride in, in the role that I played in that to get that project built and up and running and become the success that it is. Now, at about the same time, you told me that you had an opportunity on 2nd Avenue and 28th Street <laughs> to do an investment. So besides practicing law, you started to dabble in ownership. And what was that? You, there was an well, apartment house or something, a guy named Katz? Or? <laughs> <laughs> there was a, a, young, a young attorney who had worked in-house for Bob Olnick uh, by the name of Norman Siegel, who learned a lot about the development business from Bob Olnick and decided he wanted to build a project on his own. And he uh, met somebody who had a lot of vacant lands. And you know, today, uh, a lot of the vacant land that was historically in Manhattan was controlled by people in the parking business and a fellow by the name of Dan Katz had a, a parking lot on 28th Street and 2nd Avenue, and this young man who had worked for Bob Olnick, and Bob had given him the encouragement to do this on his own, had worked to get a HUD commitment to build the apartment house on 28th Street and 2nd Avenue, which uh, is called, no, the, Clar the Clarendon. And everybody laughed, they thought a young man without any backing, could, could get something accomplished. Even Dan Katz, who had given him an option on the parking lot, laughed at his grandiose plans. But I helped Norman to get that project off the ground, you and raised, we became partners. Right, you raised, you, you went, and I believe you told me, you went to 10 clients or 10 friends, <laughs> and you said, Give me forty-five thousand dollars, and no, that was what had, what had happened, each. Michael. What had happened is, uh, at the time, uh, Norman needed, I believe, around five hundred thousand dollars in equity to get this project off the ground, and his family had promised to give him the money. And two weeks before the closing, when it when it came time to put up the money, the family said, "I'm not going to give money to Norman. He never built anything in his life." So he came to me, and I was able to introduce him to 10 of my clients, one of which was myself, 
And we each gave him, uh, I think it was $50,000, and owned one-tenth of, of a portion of the project. And the rest is history. It became a very successful project. Then you went to the west side on 61st yep. Street. Similar prop property. Well, there was, that was another property that, uh, that Norman uh, uh, had his eyes on. It was on 61st off of Columbus. I believe it's today called the Beaumont. And uh, Norman and I developed that property and got it ready, re ready for a closing. And just before the closing, I remember Norman was walking his wife, Gail, to her class at Fordham Law School, which was just west of the site. And he called me about a week before and he said, Lenny, I don't want to sell that property. I've decided I have to build something again like the Claritin and show everybody that I am truly a builder. But I think it was Dan Brodsky who had come to us and said that he needed a project ready to be built for his organization. And I was able to convince Norman that we should sell that property and let Dan build it because Dan, ha Dan had a regular organization. And I promised him I would find him another parcel to develop. Now, everybody in New York knows Zabar's. <laughs> so our friend Lenny Boxer, accountant, attorney, consigliere, now meets Stanley Zabar, and you build with Stanley the Montana? Well, Stanley is an old friend of mine. It was a client and a close personal friend. And uh, Stanley had uh, a acquired many of the properties on the Upper West Side. And uh, he was vacating the space above the Zabar's store, as you know it is now, on uh, 83rd. 83rd and Broadway. And there was a terrible community outcry about being displaced. And they became very sensitive about it perhaps tarnishing the Zabar image from their food emporium. And Stanley and his partner, uh, Murray Klein, had also owned the block front on the east side of Broadway between 87th and 88th Street. And Norman and I had been looking for another site to develop after we sold the Beaumont. And I convinced Stanley that he doesn't need any aggravation because at the time the site was occupied, even though it was only retail tenants with short-term leases. I said, Stanley, you don't want to get involved with vacating these people. They'll find out that Zabar's is again opposing tenants. And Stanley and Murray Klein decided to sell it to us. And as a result of our purchasing the block front on Broadway between 87th and 88th Street, we were then able to develop the Montana, which is there today, which is one of the premier rental projects on the Upper West Side. But it wasn't easy to finance at that time when we built it because they weren't quite sure that a luxury rental would be received on the Upper West Side. But also north of 86th Street. Yeah, and it was north of 86th Street, and I think the only other high-rise residential building of any substance was on 96th Street that was built by Bill Zeckendorf. I think it was called the Columbia. Columbia 96. Which was a condominium. And, and which it, had problems also. Uh, yeah, it had problems selling the units because, again, it was north of 86th Street. And I remember going to uh, Connie Stevenson, who was in charge of, uh, of lending for the Chase Manhattan Bank, and telling Steve that this was a project that should be built. It is being done intelligently, and it was something that the Upper West Side really needs and it's a luxury rental project. And I remember Steve coming to me and saying, Lenny, I got the approval to finance it, but you seem to think, and your partner seems to think, that large apartments will rent on the Upper West Side. We are very nervous about large apartments. And I remember when we finalized the plans with Jordan Grusin, who was our architect, we had to make the three-bedroom apartments 
divisible. In the event we couldn't rent them, we could split them up and rent them as a, a one bedroom and a studio or two one bedrooms to make sure that we didn't end up with too, too many three bedroom apartments. But the rest is history. Norman and myself were absolutely correct. That's just what the Upper West Side needed, larger apartments for families. Now, now there's a change. Now you, and it, you're, you're still practicing law, everybody, <laughs> and you still practice law today. And then it's, you were very instrumental in Battery Park City. Mm -hmm. And initially, you, you represented the left racks when they built the first residential. But that wasn't the, the item I really want to talk about. You were very instrumental in keeping Sandy Weil and American Express in Battery Park City. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, it really, it really you can't divorce that from what happened with respect to uh, the what's known as uh, Marina Towers and the Gateway Project, which was really the first development at Battery Park City. And had that development not been built, there was a good possibility that the bonds that had financed the landfill at Battery Park City, there could have been a default there because there was no income coming in. And it was at the time of a transition in the government uh, when I believe it was Malcolm Wilson going out and you Carey coming in and Charlie Erstadt was the commissioner then and the one thing that Charlie Erstadt wanted was to see something built at Battery Park City and with the ingenuity of the partnership that really owned this development which was my partner Bob Alnick uh, the Lefrak organization, Sam and Richard Lefrak, and Lester Fisher. They had controlled that site. And had that site not been built, it's a good possibility that what you see now as a great success at Battery Park might not have happened. Yeah. But that was the forerunner of it. Once we built that project, the next step to reach its real potential at Battery Park City was to have the commercial portion of the site built. And there were many questions about whether downtown could be a residential community. And it was a very difficult task. And I'll tell you, I give a lot of credit, uh, well, not only to Jim Robinson, but it was basically Sandy Wiles idea that uh, American Express should keep their world headquarters in New York. And at the time, they had a building at 125 Broad Street. And we got involved in a very complex transaction where their interest in 125 Broad Street was swapped for what's known as Building C at the World Financial Center, which I may add was the only building that was not owned by Olympia or New York. So it was not caught up in the latter troubles of Olympia in New York. American Express ended up owning that building. You know, later on in life, but I'm going to get back to your development, but it's very interesting. People may realize that Battery Park City was built basically from the land, from the, the fill where the World Trade Center. Mm -hmm. in, in 2001, Lenny Boxer gets back to that landfill, <laughs> but on the other side, because... You are well, the consigliere, and I think the quote was Larry Silverstein saying in numerous times, without my friend Lenny Boxer, I wouldn't have been the leaseholder in this situation. Well, listen, that's one of my great prides of my career as I look back at it. You know, obviously it's bittersweet, but Larry had this idea about owning uh, the leaseholds at, better, at uh, the World Trade Center. And quite frankly, people thought that it was a pipe dream. I mean, you know as well as I do, every major player was trying to get hold of that leasehold. And I must say that several of the people who were in the mix had come to me and asked me if I would represent them in that transaction. And I owed a debt of gratitude to Larry Silverstein, who was one of my oldest friends. And Larry had a passion about that. I mean, that passion you see today, and I think not only does the city and the country owe him a debt of gratitude, but if Larry didn't have this passion, one, he never would have been able to gain control of the leaseholds, 
And after the tragedy happened, if Larry didn't have that passion, I think if, if there wasn't a developer involved with the site, now it's taken five years to see some positive movement at the site. It would take another five mm -hmm. years before anything would happen. But during this time that Larry and that, Lenny Boxer starts continuing to do some other developments. I mean, <laughs> uh, you did with Bob Onick, uh, the Excelsior. You did with Bob Onick, the Latreon on 2nd Avenue. And then all of a sudden, you go to New Jersey. I mean, you're a Brooklyn boy. How do you get to New Jersey, Hoboken, originally? Mm -hmm. um, well, Larry, uh, when um, Bob Olnick passed away, um, he had a partner by the name of Lester Fisher. Lester Fisher was one of the original Fisher brothers. He was Martin's son. And he left the Fisher brothers really to do the Battery Park transaction with Bob Olnick and Sam Lefrak. And when Bob died, uh, Lester asked me to join him in doing development transactions. And the first transaction of any significance that he and I were able to find was Hudson View Towers, which was a 320 unit residential development in Hoboken, which was a, a rental development that was very successful. And then after that you did the largest, re the, another rental, but now you said, I'm going to get closer to the left rack and the, everything else. You went to Jersey City with Liberty, right? Well, that's an interesting story. Uh, uh, Colgate had developed the Colgate site in Jersey City, and there was one site that was available for residential development. We would we looked at that site and we said, how do we get control of that site? And we came up, I must say, it was, was a very interesting thing. We, we bought a site immediately adjacent to the Colgate site, which was an old factory that was owned by, owned by somebody by the name of Wald, and it was unzoned, that site. And what we did was we gained control of that site, and we filed a plan for a 40-story tower and when Reuben Mark, the head of Colbert, Colgate, found out that we were going to build a 40-story tower adjacent to the Colgate site, he immediately called us in and we were able to negotiate to take over a site that was a residential site that, that was in the Colgate Center. So, you know, for a kid from Brooklyn, from Erasmus Hall to NYU, you've done a lot. and. Um, You've built a lot in New York. You've represented every major developer. Uh, and you truly are a builder of New York. And I'm really happy that you were here to be my guest today. Thank, Thank you. you for having me, Michael. Major funding for this program is provided by grants from HSH Nordbank, New York Branch, and First American Title Insurance Company of New York. Additional funding is provided by grants from Signature Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, the Wickhoff Group, and the Engel Berman Group.